Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining us this morning for um, another series of our training program. This is what this one's going to be on administrator processing and funding presented by DFA, OPP, and DDW. Um, we have James Garrett from DFA, Saida Rafi from uh, DDW, and Rachel Wittenberg from OPP. James, can you, yeah, thank you. Um, to participate in today's training, please hold off on all verbal questions or comments until we reach the end of each section. The presenter at that time will then um, either dismiss us for a break or you can ask your questions at that time. Presenters will provoke time for questions. Please use this, this time to raise use the raise hand function. Uh, you may add questions to the chat throughout the presentation and they will be addressed as they are received. Today's agenda, we will review the SAFER program. Um, the administrator program overview will go over the history, the goals, and the roles and responsibilities. Um, the administrator appointment process, and then we'll review a case study. Um, we'll have a community outreach and engagement overview, uh, reviewing the public meetings and elements of community accountability and engagement planned. And then we will end off with the administrator funding program. And we can have questions later at that time as well. We will start off with the safer drinking water program overview from Rachel Wittenberg from OPP. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Rachel Wittenberg, and I'm a Safer Drinking Water Program Manager in the Office of Public Participation. And we'll start today with a brief overview of the Safer Program. Safer, or Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resilience, was established in 2019. The Safer Drinking Water Program is an extension of a long history of California bills related to drinking water. Most recently, AB 685, adopted in 2012, established the human right to water as state law. To advance the human right to water, SAFER is working to ensure that all Californians have access to safe and affordable drinking water. This is being done through a set of program tools, funding sources, and regulatory authority. SAFER prioritizes collaboration and voluntary solutions and relies upon regulatory solutions only when necessary. Slide, please. Let's discuss why SAFER is necessary. The map on the right is a screenshot of the Drinking Water Needs Assessment Dashboard. The orange and red dots represent community water systems with drinking water violations. Of the around 3,000 community water systems in California, the majority are serving safe drinking water. Around 400 do not meet safe drinking water standards. 90% of the violations taking place are in water systems with fewer than 500 connections, so these are small water systems and many do serve disadvantaged communities. One thing to note is that this map does not show approximately 350,000 domestic wells and 1,350 state small water systems. Nor does it show tribal water systems, which are regulated by the federal government. So SAFER is helping these struggling systems to implement solutions that will allow them to sustainably provide safe and affordable drinking water to their customers. So how did we get here? As California's water infrastructure was being developed, waves of migrants were settling in various farm worker and dairy labor camps. Many of these camps later grew into small communities and eventually several became cities. However, historically, decision makers used race to establish structures and systems, including land use practices. Because of this, cities often grew around these small migrant communities, creating fringe communities located outside of incorporated areas and municipal services. Without access to municipal services, Many communities formed special districts. Others sought water through mutual water companies, small cities, domestic wells, and state small water systems. These historic land use structures continue to deliver disparate outcomes, including wealth, health, educational, and environmental inequities. Many of the communities that have experienced these historic land use structures are also the communities that do not have safe drinking water. The Water Boards is committed to racial equity and environmental justice. And we hope that through the SAFER program, we can achieve the human right to water for all Californians. Through SAFER, public water systems and domestic wells in California that are failing 
or that are at risk of failing to provide safe drinking water are proactively identified, allowing us to provide assistance where most needed to ensure communities get access to safe and affordable drinking water as quickly as possible. Slide, please. We'll now take a moment to review some roles of our offices within SAFER. As you can see from the blue and yellow sections, the Division of Drinking Water identifies systems in need by focusing on assessing data, conducting the annual needs assessment, and providing monitoring. DDW also serves as a regulatory authority by addressing non-compliant systems and advancing solutions, such as the appointment of administrators and mandating consolidations. In partnership with these activities, DFA supports overall system health by focusing on long-term planning, ensuring communities have interim solutions, and working to advance consolidations and other regional solutions. Slide, please. As for the Office of Public Participation, our focus is on outreach and engagement. Three areas of focus are community needs, outreach, and communications. Central to OPP's work is adapting to the particular needs of each community, as community inputs are the foundation for engagement planning. This includes accommodating a preference for in-person meetings or virtual meetings, that includes location types, such as schools, whereas others may prefer to meet outdoors. And it also includes the frequency and method of staying in touch, such as quarterly or monthly flyers. We also provide written translation and oral interpretation services. Those are always provided in a language that is spoken by at least 5% of the population of that community. It's also available upon request. The language access team is also continuously advocating for language access with our partner offices and innovating ways to better provide this access. To help effect effectively implement tailored community outreach approaches, this year we're adding a focus on standardizing how we and our partner offices approach engagement in a way that honors the distinct situations, histories, cultures, needs, and wants of each of these communities. This means ensuring key questions are always asked, such as what is the language makeup of this community and how can I ensure that all residents have equal access to written and verbal communication? The answer implementation will be different across communities, but the question it sh itself should come up across the board. We also collaborate with community coalitions to maintain dialogue. A priority is to build and maintain strong relationships with local community groups so that solutions are developed in partnership and will be able to reach long-term sustainability. Additionally, we work to develop new funding mechanisms to support local engagement. A current example of this is the Funding Partner Project. The purpose of this project is to support local water champions in their, community, in their community work. These are folks that might not otherwise have the opportunity to receive funding through the traditional mechanisms. So for this funding partner initiative, this is a firm that has already successfully completed the lengthy process to receive funding from the state and has been able to disperse that funding to individuals and organizations in a much more timely manner. We also work to implement effective communication strategies. So similar to the earlier note on tailored outreach approaches, the communication strategy also focuses on developing a tailored approach based on how each community receives information. That includes the use of bilingual social media, radio outreach, and emails as examples of sub some avenues for getting information to residents. Before we move on to the administrator program overview, I'll pause here for questions. And you can also feel free to put your questions in the chat as well, and we can address those as we go. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to Saida from DDW. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Saida, and I'm a water resources control engineer with the Division of Drinking Water in the SAFER program. Um, so as we know, the SAFER program uses a set of tools to help water systems provide safe, accessible, and affordable drinking water. And in rare cases, one of these tools is the administrator program. And so I'll be providing an overview. Um, to begin, what is an administrator? So an administrator is an entity whom the state board has determined is competent to take managerial control over a designated water system, either completely or at a limited capacity. So this means that there are two types of administrators, which I will talk about in a few slides. 
The goal of the administrator program is to assist failing and at-risk water systems in obtaining safe, clean, affordable, accessible, and sustainable drinking water through the direct management and community representation for the designated water system. <clears throat> so how did the administrator program come about? Well, in September of 2018, Assembly Bill 2501 amended Health and Safety Code Section 116686 to require the State Board to develop an administrator um, policy. Since there are many um, disadvantaged and severely disadvantaged community water systems that are not being ran efficiently or properly, ultimately leading them to become failing and at risk of, or at risk of failing. So this policy was first adopted in September of 2019 to provide a set of standards, terms, and procedures that apply to the selection and duties of appointed administrators for designated water systems. And the most uh, recent revision to this policy was executed in September of 2023. And you can access this policy handbook on our administrator website if you're interested. Um, I would like to note that prior to the administrator program, the only mechanism to take over operational and managerial control of a water system was through a process of a receivership, which is a lengthy process and requires a court order. And also there are no state funds available through our division of financial assistance to support a receivership. On the other hand, um, the administrator process is also lengthy, but it does not require a court order and it is funded through um, DFA. So as I stated a few slides ago, there are two types of administrators, full scope and limited scope. A full scope administrator is authorized to exercise total and complete managerial control over one or more designated water systems. This includes distributing water bills, legal responsibilities, operating the water system, hosting public meetings, and um, developing improvement projects. A limited scope administrator um, does not have complete managerial or financial control over a water system. A limited scope administrator may manage one or more specific tasks. So for example, it can be an administrator who only manages a grant funded project. Some specific administrator roles and responsibilities include community accountability and engagement, water system management, facilitating infrastructure projects, and implementing a post-administrator drinking water service plan. So community accountability and engagement means an administrator must act in the best interest of the water system and community it serves. This includes ratepayers, renters, and property owners. Administrators shall establish relationships through a community accountability and engagement plan, which includes um, outreach, public meetings, and regular updates at least every three months. Water system management refers to the improvement of a water system's administrative and project management skills to maintain a sustainable governance model. So the administrator would essentially train the water system to develop and maintain these skills. Then we have the um, facilitating infrastructure projects, which is a little more self-explanatory. It's just managing an infrastructure project on behalf of a designated water system. And lastly, we have the post-administrator drinking water service plan. This is a roadmap for the water system and it identifies, evaluates, recommends, and implements solutions as it relates to the designated water system's ability to sustainably provide an adequate supply of safe, affordable, safe and affordable drinking water. Um, and this can include uh, TMF capacity, long-term governance, infrastructure projects, risk mitigation, and consolidation. So I've been saying designated water systems uh, throughout this presentation, and you might be wondering what that means. Um, so per Health and Safety Code Section 116686, 
A designated water system can be a public water system that has been ordered to consolidate through a mandatory consolidation order, a public water system that serves a disadvantaged community and consistently fails to provide an adequate supply of safe and affordable drinking water, meaning their safer status is failing, or it can be an at-risk water system. It's important to note that due to um, limited resources, the state board's use of an administrator is rare and is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Meeting the definition of a designated water system does not mean that the water system will be appointed an administrator. Appointment of an administrator is case-by-case -case basis and at the discretion of the state board. Um, so I can take a pause here and open the floor for questions. I know that this was a lot of information. Um, can I ask a question, Fida? Sure. Um, the uh, at-risk water system category that was just on the screen, um, does that include state smalls and domestic wells? Can an administrator be appointed there? I'll defer to Chad. Yeah, the administrator authority is for public water systems. So the answer okay. there is no. Yeah. Thank you, Chad. Any other questions before I move on to the administrator appointment process? I'll take that as a no. Uh, next slide. So here's a quick overview of the administrator appointment process. Um, I'll briefly describe each one after this slide. So um, first we have a designation letter to the water system, then a public notice goes out, um, then there's a public meeting and a period for public comment. After this, um, a scope of work and funding details are established. Then the administrator is appointed, um, after that, the administrator implements their scope of work. And lastly, there is a transition and concluding period. So step one is the um, designation letter. This is where the state board will notify the water system that they have been identified as um, consistently failing to provide an adequate supply of safe clean and affordable drinking water to a disadvantaged community. And the system is given an opportunity to prove otherwise. Step two is public notification. The community is provided with a written notice of a public meeting to discuss the administrator appointment decision at approximately 30 days before the public meeting. And the potential administrator candidate uh, shall be disclosed in this notice if they've already been identified. Step three is the public meeting and public comment period. So here the state board will review the administrator process with the community, including an overview of tasks, administrator qualifications, and how they will be funded. <clears throat> the name of the administrator candidate will be shared with the public by written notice when identified. Um, and the community will also have the opportunity to provide comments on the proposed selected administrator. Step four is scoping and funding. This is where the state board develops a plan for the water system, including um, scope of work, budget, and funding for the administrator's salary. Step five is the administrator appointment. So this is where the administrator is officially appointed to take managerial control of a designated water system via an administrator order. Step six is the implementation period where the administrator fulfills their duties. And this includes a community accountability and engagement plan to be developed within 120 days of appointment holding public meetings to share updates every three months, a post-administrator drinking water service plan within 12 months of appointment. And of course, there may be um, other items in the scope of work. Lastly, we have step seven, which is where the appointment concludes and there's a transition period. 
So the administrator will transition managerial control of the water system to a sustainable form of governance with the post-administrator drinking water service plan in effect. As I stated um, a couple of slides ago, the post-administrator drinking water service plan is like a roadmap for the water system. Sometimes um, all the tasks within this plan are accomplished by the administrator, or they can be accomplished by the new governance structure or a technical assistant, but the point is to continue um, with the plan. And of course, the transition period is um, case by case. So I'll take another pause here for questions before moving on to the next section. We do have a couple of questions in uh, the chat. Uh, first one's a comment. The scope and funding step can take a long time for Easterosi. This step nearly took uh, two years. Um, I don't know if you want to address that or. I think I, I, I'll i take a second to, um, hi, Ryan. Um, I think that's a great point from Ryan. Um, maybe, and maybe there's two kind of comments that I think of. One is uh, the administrator program is fairly new, right? It isn't like implementation of our core regulatory program or something that we've been doing for decades. So we definitely was a, it definitely has been a, a learn by doing um, effort, I'll say, and, and certainly not without delay. So, um, we, uh, I think we're seeing some improvement on, on, I know we're seeing some improvement there on timelines, just as we all underline again, learn and then refine our processes. So, um, that isn't to take away anything from Ryan's comment because he's, he's spot on. It's not easy it's not short and uh, yeah, anyway, so thanks. Thank you. Um, another question we have is what was, oops, just lost it. It looks like it was just answered. <laughs> oh yeah. Months. That's okay. what I thought I heard. I just wanted to confirm. Great, thank you. Um, and then if we have additional questions about the administrator roles and responsibility, who can we reach out to? I'm specifically interested in learning on how administrators maintain community representation while the system is under the administrator. I can try to tackle this and, and maybe OPP also wants to chime in, but Kira, um, I don't really like usually pointing to a website, but our administrator website is is pretty good and has quite a few resources. And I think the administrator policy handbook is um, it's not light reading, but it is a good read on it because it outlines the expectations of of your question and the outline it outlines the expectations for the administrator generally. And a big part of that administrator expectation is about community engagement and accountability. I don't know if the OPP wants to add. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Chad. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think a good idea, we, we just make sure that we share out our contact info with all of you at the end so we can have those one-on-one -on -one or smaller group chats to talk in more depth about that. Um, we will be talking a little bit more about the community representation aspect of administrator appointments a little bit later on in the presentation today. Um, but of course, we can only fit so much into a presentation, so it will be somewhat general. So I'd be happy to talk to you, um, either myself or some of the counterparts in OPP or all of the above, can have a bit more in-depth conversation going through examples of those plans um, and maybe some examples of how that's played out so far. Perfect. Thank you. That's all the questions we have in chat. Thank you. Um... We can move on. So now I'll share with y'all a specific administrator case study at Keeler Community Services District. So Keeler is located in a small remote area in Inyo County. This system serves a population of 84 people through 66 service connections. 
Keeler landed on our failing list due to water quality issues and lack of technical, managerial, and financial capacity. The system has had a history of arsenic and manganese MCL exceedances and does not have an adequate treatment for it, which leaves the community without a safe and reliable source of drinking water and exposes them to health risks. On top of that, Keeler CSD had difficulty maintaining a full board, and given the fact that the system is in a remote area, they lacked technical staff, including certified operators, and had difficulty maintaining effective operations and maintenance activities. And this all contributed to having failed effective communication across the board. And last but not least, Keeler CSD was also having financial difficulties. They lack the financial capacity to implement solutions and have an asset management program. So due to all of these issues, the state deemed it appropriate to appoint an administrator at Keeler CSD. The administrator is Provost and Pritchard Engineering Group, and I'll refer to them as PNP for short. Um, here you can see uh, the administrator process timeline up to where we currently are, which is the implementation step. So a designation letter was served in January of 2021. Then a public notice went out in April of 2021. A public meeting was held on May 18 of 2021. And the public comment period ended on May 25th of 2021. <clears throat> PNP was officially appointed in March of 2022. The scope and funding was executed in November of 2022, and PNP started their scope of work in March of 2023 and is currently ongoing. Moving on to accomplishments, um, PNP has had a positive impact on the system during this implementation phase. They've established a governance plan, emergency response plan, operations plan, financial management plan, and a community accountability and engagement plan. They also launched an administrator-specific website within Keeler CSD's website for community members to submit comments and access meeting agendas, notices, recordings, and summaries. Regarding um, public education, I'll give a quick backstory. So um, previous operators and community members were adjusting valves and performing services when they weren't authorized to do so. Um, so PNP educated the community about meters and informed them that they were breaking laws by manipulating the system. PNP um, also recently changed contract operators to an operator who is more able and better equipped to serve the community. <clears throat> like I mentioned before, Keeler's remote location limits the number of people who want and are able to take on the work in this area. So this is a huge accomplishment for the system. PNP has also supported a technical assistance effort in completing a well site cleanup and flood berm realignment. Um, they've made small system improvements as well such as repairing leaks and valves and replacing a well production meter. PNP's current projects under development include supporting GHD, who is a technical assistant, on an alternatives analysis for a long-term solution for Keeler CSD. And they're also working on replacing the signal wiring between um, the well and tank. This is a high priority test as failure of the wire could interrupt the communication between um, the well and storage tank and result in water outages. <clears throat> Overall, we would like to thank PNP for all their hard work and dedication at Keeler CSD. And we're looking forward to see the rest of the appointment be carried out. Um, and this is all I have, so I'll take another pause here for uh, questions on this specific section.
Um, I don't see any questions, so um, we can take a quick break here and reconvene in 10 minutes. Um, otherwise, please feel free to drop your questions yeah. in the chat. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. It's only just turned 1045, so I'm just going to give it a few more potatoes here, let people come on back from the breaks, starting momentarily. All right, everyone, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us again. Hello again. And we'll go ahead and continue this next portion with a brief section on outreach and engagement. Slide, please. OPP's purpose in the administrator process is to keep community inputs and needs at the front of the discussion, and we provide the support under the SAFER program umbrella in partnership with DDW, DFA, and TA providers to support community engagement. So part of what we do is engaging communities in the decision-making process, and to that end, OPP also ensures that public meetings are designed to promote community participation, and that can include things like selecting venues and formats that reflect that community's preferences. Also, ensuring equitable access is key. So to that end, OPP identifies needs for translation and interpretation services and determines what type of outreach is appropriate for the community. This includes assessing digital accessibility. For example, in some cases, digital surveys or Zoom meetings may be appropriate, but in others, door knocking and maybe meeting at a local school might be more effective. So it's all about determining what's going to be in the best interests of that particular community. However, for meetings for some of these processes, there could be several months in between, and that can be a really long time to go without a community having any word about what a status or next steps might be. So it's also really important to have engagement throughout the entire process and not just for the meetings themselves. So in addition to meetings, OPP also builds and maintains relationships with communities and keeps an open dialogue. So that includes engagement in between those meetings such as updating FAQs, reaching out regularly with any updates or current status, sending out mailers, and more. For the administrator meetings themselves, OPP's role is to create opportunity for community members to learn a bit more about the administrator process, learn who might be opportunities for uh, which entity would potentially be an administrator, and also to provide their input. Slide, please. In public meetings about the administrator process, OPP helps identify areas in need of support and to propose potential administrators to the community who are then able to provide their input. Also messaging about administrators is key. Many of these communities are passionate advocates for their own water solutions, and they may have concerns about an outside entity becoming involved. Therefore, it's really important to express that an administrator is not meant to remove local control over the system, nor is it a permanent solution. As we discussed earlier, Administrators are required to present a post-administrator plan, and they're also intended to be in place to advance drinking water solutions and to support the system. Slide, please. So earlier we had a question about community representation throughout the administrator process. So um, right now we're gonna go ahead and have a little opportunity to discuss that a little bit further. Part of what administrators can do to support effective relationships with communities is to produce a community accountability and engagement plan. So there is an existing template for this plan that administrators can use to develop their community-specific plan, and they must have that plan completed within 90 days. Some examples of content that's included in these plans includes the requirement for public meetings. So public meetings must be held once every three months, and administrators are required to notice them ahead of time to provide an opportunity for public comment, as well as to provide summaries afterward. So all those actions help ensure that communities continue to be involved throughout the administrator appointment. The community accountability and engagement plan also includes an overview of the water system and its drinking water issues. It includes a community profile and demographics. And that section is used a lot to inform whether there is um, a language service need at play, um, whether there is a digital access um, need that needs to be considered for meetings. So a lot of that information would come up in that demographics section. And it also includes a section on community engagement and communications, which describes how the administrator plans on communicating with the community. So they do have to say, I'm gonna send out digital surveys or I'm gonna send out written notices or I'm gonna door knock. So all of that will be listed there. 
And as you heard earlier, community accountability engagement means that an administrator must act in the best interest of the water system and the community it serves, including ratepayers, renters, and property owners. This plan describes how the administrator will show accountability to the community it is serving. In addition, the template of the plan also includes sample outreach materials that can help the administrators with their outreach. So a couple of examples of that include surveys and bill inserts, um, so that way they don't have to develop all of the outreach materials on their own. They already have it in template form and they can just adapt it to the community they're working with. I know that was a very broad, quick overview. Um, again, to our earlier conversation, very happy to sit down and chat in more in depth um, about this anytime. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and pause before we move on and see if there are any questions at this time. I'm gonna go ahead and ch check the chat as well in case I missed anything. I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but I do wanna note if you haven't seen it, that Saida did drop a few links in there. So we've got a link now to the administrator policy handbook, as well as to the administrator website, if you wanna have any additional um, resources there. Hi, Michelle, I see your hand up. Hey, yeah, I did think of a question. Um, is there a place where community members can go and access that community county, community accountability and engagement plan? for that their administrator develops? Yeah, you know, I actually am not sure. I don't know the answer to that. Um, Chad, do you know if that's something that is disseminated to the community as well? Yes, that should be uploaded to like a community website or there can be a copy at a community repository or um, like a library, a community library, but it gotcha. should be made available to the community. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and we do also go back over these plans once the administrator has their portion that they filled out. They'll send that back up to the water board so we can all give input and they can make any necessary edits before the finalized version. So there's that opportunity for reflection on it as well, um, at least at the state level to make sure it kind of suits that community. Good question. Thank you, Michelle. I'll we'll pause for a few more beats here. Are there any other immediate questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any right now. Again, feel free to drop any in the chat if you have them or ask again at the end. Um, but for now, I will go ahead and hand it off to James from DFA. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And yeah, thank you everyone for the questions this morning. Um, you know, we definitely appreciate those. Please keep them coming um, and keep thinking of questions as I take us into our last section that we had here for you this morning, talking about the administrator funding. So. Um, I guess first off, my name is James Garrett. I am a senior water resource control engineer with the Division of Financial Assistance at the State Water Board, and I supervise the Small Community Technical Assistance and Administrators Unit at DFA. So I'll just start by providing some background on uh, the, where the funding for our program and how it's provided. Um, funding for the administrator program, it is provided as part of the larger safe and affordable funding for equity and resilience or safer program. So the water board funds administrators using two different funding sources. The first was the general fund uh, authorized from assembly bill 72 provision eight, which was appropriated an initial $10 million, which we needed to encumber by June 30th of 2022. Um, so this was the funding source that was used to fund our initial administrator assignments. Uh, the second source and the funding source that's available to us now is the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, which appropriates up to $130 million annually. And there's a portion of which from that fund can be, um, can be allocated to fund administrator projects. And target allocations uh, for administrators are identified each year in the annual update to the fund expenditure plan for the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. The target allocations of the SADW fund, they will be consistent with the priorities of the broader Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resilience program, and they will be used in conjunction with other available complementary funding at DFA. And so, um, Overall, DFA considers administrator funding 
as indirect operation and maintenance support given to a water system. And I did want to touch on the priorities of the SAFER program as well. Um, so to give you an overview, these are our priorities for the SAFER program this fiscal year. And these continue to focus our efforts on small disadvantaged communities and low income households. Um, just note that these are not listed in a ranked order and that the needs of out of compliance systems are generally prioritized over at risk systems. The priorities are to address any emergency or urgent funding needs expeditiously only where other emergency funds are not available and a critical water shortage or outage could occur without support from the fund. Address community water systems and school water systems consistently out of compliance with primary drinking water standards or at risk of failing or water systems relying on bottled water or hauled water in the past three years. The priority is to accelerate consolidations for consistently out of compliance at risk systems, as well as state smalls and domestic wells near water system boundaries and promote opportunities for regional scale consolidations. There's a priority to expedite planning through use of technical assistance for systems out of compliance, at risk systems, as well as state smalls and domestic wells. Um, provide interim solutions, initiate planning efforts for long-term solutions, and fund capital projects for state smalls and domestic wells with source water above a primary maximum contaminant level or at risk of running dry due to drought. It's a priority to provide direct operation and maintenance support to assist community water systems facing the highest affordability burdens, and also to ensure assistance is distributed in a manner that's consistent with the goals and directions provided in the state water board's racial equity resolution and associated action plan. Um, so again, these are the broad priorities of the SAFER program. And next few slides, I'll talk about how the administrator funding specifically helps to support these program priorities. So this slide touches on really how the funding process for the administrator gets triggered. DFA uh, will work in close coordination with Division of Drinking Water while they are going through the process of appointing an administrator to a designated water system. So to re reiterate on what Saida said earlier, systems identified that are in need of an administrator will be um, a disadvantaged community, which means they're less than 80% of the statewide median household income. Um, so it'd be a disadvantaged community that fails to consistently provide an adequate supply of safe drinking water. They could also be a system that has been ordered by the state board to consolidate, or they may be a system that is identified as at risk uh, based on results of the drinking water needs analysis. So taking these criteria into account, uh, Division of Financial Assistance coordinates with DDW on administrator orders to provide related funding where it's eligible and appropriate. So the form that you see on the right side of the screen here, that's an example of the administrator funding request that DDW will submit to DFA. And it essentially starts the process of getting the funding approved for the administrator. Now this request does come directly from the Division of Drinking Water, Safer Drinking Water section. And I just wanted to mention that because it's, it's important to be aware that a drinking water system, it, they, they do not, and really they, they cannot apply directly to Division of Financial Assistance for administrator funding. Um, you know, the, the funding process is intertwined with the, the larger um, process of getting an administrator appointed. So after public notice has been given, after a potential administrator has been identified for the community, and after receiving the administrator funding request, DFA will then provide the administrator um, or the identified administrator with a general scope of work template and a budget template, and we'll work with the administrator, uh, DDW and OPP to draft the scope of work and budget that would be included in their funding agreement. Uh, DFA has developed two types of funding vehicles uh, that would provide funding to the administrator. And it really depends on the preference from the administrator when deciding which one makes the most sense um, taking into account their situation. So 
The first option for funding is the quote one-off funding agreement, which provides a single funding agreement to fund a single administrator assignment. Um, these tend to make sense when we have one entity that would act as an administrator just for uh, one water system. And then the second option would be the quote master agreement funding agreement. Um, these establish a blanket funding agreement that's similar to what we have in place with TA providers. Uh, and DFA assigns a work plan to be executed under the master agreement for each administrator assignment. So these master agreements are appropriate when it's likely that um, one administrator would act as an administrator for multiple water systems. And so in, going into further detail, here's a rundown of the differences between the one-off and the master funding agreements. So each agreement does follow a different process to accomplish the goal of funding the administrator. First, with a one-off funding agreement, after the funding request gets submitted by DDW, DFA will provide the identified administrator with the most recent scope of work and budget template documents to begin, de um, to begin drafting the detailed scope and putting together the budget estimate. Um, I'll also mention here that prior even to this first step for funding, um, in the process of identifying the administrator, DFA will have already conducted an eligibility review to identify potential issues with being able to enter into a funding agreement with the administrator. Um, and, you know, we want to identify any of these potential issues um, ahead of time while the public process is still um, moving forward. So that eligibility review for funding, it includes looking at the administrator's financial statements. Uh, we would look at their business status, also review for any potential conflict of interest, and also confirm that the administrator carries the minimum recommended insurance. So an administrator's costs to develop the project from this point would be eligible for reimbursement upon execution of the funding agreement. Once drafted, the administrator will submit the scope and budget documents to DFA for review. There may be some back and forth review in order to finalize the details, but once the proposal gets finalized, DFA then sends a funding recommendation to the deputy director for approval. And once we have received funding approval, DFA contracts staff then begins the process of drafting the funding agreement. Once the funding agreement is issued and signed by both the administrator and DFA, it will then be officially executed and eligible costs can be reimbursed to the administrator and the order can also be issued. So that's the one-off agreement process. The other process, the master agreement funding agreement is an approach that's you know, similar to um, the approach that we take on agreements that DFA has in place with our technical assistance providers. And so for these, we've entered into master agreements with engineering consulting firms who had been qualified by the board to be appointed as an administrator. And under these master agreements, we're able to assign a work plan for each drinking water system that these firms will be appointed to as the administrator. So once DFA receives a funding request, which identifies the administrator that has a master agreement already executed with DFA, we would then assign the funding request as a work plan. Once assigned, that administrator is authorized under their master agreement to incur up to $30,000 to conduct initial outreach to the community, complete an evaluation of the system's needs, and draft a work plan and budget for the administrator assignment. Um, once drafted, the administrator will then submit that work plan to DFA for review. Um, a review is conducted of the draft with Division of Drinking Water and Office of Public Participation, and we will work through any comments on the submittal. Once finalized, we will then recommend the work plan for approval by DFA's Deputy Director. And after approval, that work plan then gets executed and the administrator order is issued and the administrator um, starts, starts implementing um, their duties for the system. So the administrator policy handbook uh, details the specific types of costs that the water board will be, sorry, the, the administrator policy handbook details the specific types of costs that the water board will be responsible for paying 
once an administrator does get appointed. So the state water board shall be responsible for the following costs. Um, it includes the salary and any benefits for the administrator, uh, any administrative costs that are attributed solely to the administrator, uh, which includes additional computers, phones, furniture, and working space requirements, um, you know, any of those workspace requirements that can be attributed directly to that administrator assignment. Um, eligible costs also include extraordinary legal, accounting, and other similar administrative and managerial fees that cannot be paid for by the designated water systems rates, fees, charges, and existing accounts. And then we would also allow payment for reasonable liability insurance costs as determined by the state water board. Um, I'll also mention that the policy handbook, the administrator policy handbook, it does identify that in the situation of an administrator who gets appointed for a regional project, they may be permitted to expend financial resources that are um, in aggregate across multiple designated water systems to increase cost effectiveness or for other appropriate uses. Um, but this, of course, would need to be done with the state water board's approval and in close coordination with the state board. There's also potential for administrators to expend financial resources on um, you know, specific studies and assessments for non-designated water systems who are willing to voluntarily participate in a regional project. Um, and again, that would only be with the approval from state water board in very specific cases. And this slide shows some examples of costs that cannot be reimbursed under an administrator funding agreement. So the designated water system shall be responsible for ordinary costs that are associated with operating and maintaining their water system. And the administrator, you know, once appointed, they are expected to continue collecting water rates from the customers and applying any revenue that is generated for operation of the water system. Uh, the system is also responsible for all planning and construction project costs that would be required to meet applicable water standards and requirements. The designated water system or the administrator that's acting on behalf of the designated water system may be awarded separate funding uh, for these purposes. And, and this I will discuss more on the next slide. However, funds that are, um, funds that are provided through an administrator funding agreement cannot be used for the purpose of funding construction implementation, planning projects, or operating and maintaining the water. And just to note, an administrator has no legal obligation to use its own assets or resources, financial or otherwise, in any way to operate the water system. Um, so that is to say that the finances of a administrator that gets appointed should be kept separate from the finances of the designated water system that they are appointed to administer. And so, as I mentioned, you know, the administrator may need to pursue other sources of funding um, if necessary for additional needs that they identify at the water system. So of course, subject to funding availability and also project eligibility, the state water board may provide separate funding to a designated water system to support additional needs that an administrator identifies. The water board is able to work with the administrator and try to determine the best applicant for funding. Uh, once an administrator has been appointed, DFA is able to provide funding to a designated water system directly. Um, they could also provide funding to the administrator, uh, the administrator's subsidiary company, or the administrator's designee, um, which is allowed by guidelines and policies that are in place as well as the authorities given by the administrator's authorizing resolution. Um, so that is to say that if there are certain concerns with DFA contracting directly with a designated water system, um, for instance, they might be in poor standing with the Franchise Tax Board, um, we would have other options to, to contract directly with the administrator or a subsidiary to you know, address funding needs and address the water quality issues for the system. So some other needs that a designated water system may require funding for might include um, O&M costs. So these would be costs to run the water system that cannot be covered by revenue generated by the water system. 
DFA could provide funding for operation and maintenance to you know, make up the difference in what the rates aren't covering. Um, they might need interim or emergency solution funding. So responding to emergency projects that occur suddenly or were unknown when the operation and maintenance budget was being prepared, um, the administrator and their operator, you know, they do need to respond to emergency situations as they arise. And um, they are expected to address these emergencies to the best of their abilities. However, they should apply for emergency funding from the water board or any other potential sources as necessary. Um, they can apply for planning and technical assistance funding. So the administrator can apply for uh, planning funding through the drinking water SRF on behalf of the water system, or they may also submit a request for technical assistance to accomplish um, any planning or engineering needs for the system. And then finally, there may be a need for construction and implementation funding. So the administrator, similarly to planning, they can apply for construction funding through the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund program. Um, they're able to apply for grants on behalf of the water system in order to help implement a permanent solution. And so my final slide this morning, um, this takes us back to the case study with Keeler CSD that Saida had discussed earlier in the presentation. So looking at um, the entirety of funding that's been provided to Keeler CSD in order to help support the water system and also support the administrator assignment to the water system. You know, this slide does summarize those efforts um, showing the funding that DFA has provided and also the work with, with DDW and OPP, along with the appointed administrator, Provost and Pritchard. So you can see there we've provided, um, currently uh, a work plan has been executed in the amount of $1.1 million for PNP to carry out the administrator duties uh, for the water system. We've also provided an operation and maintenance funding agreement um, in the amount of $111,000 this is helping to you know, stop or fill up that gap between what the rates can cover and the cost to operate the system. Um, we've also provided a bottled water funding agreement directly to the community uh, in the amount of $393,000 so that residents do have clean drinking water um, as well as water they can use for sanitary or, or cooking needs. And Finally, we have recently approved a technical assistance work plan uh, with a TA provider, a GHD, and they are currently preparing an alternatives analysis that identify, would identify long-term solutions for Keeler CSD. And the intent would be for the next steps to assist that system in applying for funding. And so that brings me to the end of my section, and it's also the end of our presentation. Um, before opening up for questions, I just wanted to, you know, note again that Saida had shared links in the chat to the um, administrator website on the Water Board's uh, webpage. We were also giving a link here on this final slide. Saida has also provided a link to the administrator policy handbook in the chat. Um, I also want to note that on our webpage, there is an administrator policy frequently asked questions document that's available. So this document is currently available. However, I would note it's in the process of being updated as we speak, um, but most of that information um, is definitely um, applicable. And with that, I can open it up for questions. Hey James, I had a I popped it in the chat, but um, I may have misspoke earlier or misunderstood. But I wanted to point of clarification around a designated water system. There's kind of three different kind of criteria or subsets. I popped it into the chat about what a designated water system can mean. Um, the question was around: Is that a public water system, um, and or a state small system? So the answer there. Again, it's in the chat, but it can be a public water system or a state small water system. Um, but 
at least at this time, doesn't uh, doesn't outline for a community served by domestic wells. Um, and then I'll stop here in a second, but I did want to note that all of the all of the systems that are currently in process for an administrator, e either already appointed or, like I said, in our process, are public water systems. So anyway, probably belabors the point, but there it is in the chat. So. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for clarifying, Chad. There's a couple more questions. Um, will we discuss how to get an administrator assigned to a water system? Um, I think that question, is it from, from Juan there? Yes. Um, is there an ability for for them to come off mute? Um, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, um, maybe could, can you ask your question in maybe a different way? Because uh, I, I, I I'm tempted to answer the question is it's the the designation process or the designation criteria, but I don't think that it probably answers your question. Yeah, so you know I'm sure we all have a in our mind here a system that could use an administrator. You know we have some. Uh, management or leadership that's not quite cutting it. Um, how do we get somebody, how do we learn how to assign or get an uh, administrator who has a, an agreement with the state assigned to a, a system that could use that uh, administrative duties? Yeah, the, the answer there is a complicated one because they're all evaluated case by case, but maybe the simpler answer is that you can, um, you can reach out to to either my staff or to so to DDW safer folks, to OPP folks, or to DFA folks to try to highlight the need in that community, and then um, we can work together to understand how to better or best meet meet the needs of that community. Um, I think we talked. I think Saida mentioned it, or maybe anyway, somebody mentioned it. Um, across the top is that the um, the administrator, you know, it's a very small subset of systems that are in this process or that and that have been designated. There is probably not probably there is a greater need than we currently have resources for in terms of administrators. Um, so um, I guess I'm just trying to balance expectation there. But um, maybe that went over and above your question, Juan. Um, certainly, you can reach out to OPP, DDW, or Jane, or or DFA staff to to highlight the needs of the specific communities you're thinking about. All right, thank you. Yeah. We have another question. How does DDW reach out to DFA to start the administration process? James, do you want me to answer this also? I think it. I can maybe start, Chad, and you can add in. Um, but I think you know we're we're working really closely um, with Division of Drinking Water throughout the the process. Um, you know, so as as Chad alluded to, it's like this subset of systems that we're we're working on, and and resources are limited, getting administrators appointed. Um, but you know, really, we're we're working closely um, with Chad's group and um, are pretty much involved throughout because as DDW is identifying um, a potential administrator, we need to also be involved on DFA's side to make sure that there's no concerns with, you know, providing funding, administrator, um, looking at, you know, issues with their finances and actually being able to enter into a funding agreement. Um, so I don't know if that really answers the question. I know the, the only one like hard and fast like submittal is that administrator funding request that I did touch on earlier in my slides. Um, you know, but even that gets submitted to DFA to start the formal funding agreement process. But there's already been a lot of coordination that's gone on behind the scenes before that point. Yeah, that answers my question. Yeah, th thank you, James. Much appreciated. Yeah, definitely. 
Michelle Struthers has her has her hand raised, but it looks like she. Did you want to go ahead and ask your your question, Michelle? Or do you want me to read it from chat? Thanks. Yeah, I just um, typed it in. I, I just am thinking about you know we're hearing all about kind of the appointment of an of an administrator, but I'm curious. You know, y'all have kind of a bird's eye view over all of these different appointments and. Um, I have some insight because I'm with the Stantec team doing work in Teveston, but i um, curious what y'all think about like the contentiousness that can come up when you have an administrator appointment and there's existing staff and board members that have a sense of kind of ownership over the system and just curious about any kind of anecdotes or lessons learned or best practices around that experience that you've kind of gotten insight to so far. I'll chip in and if others want to, uh, Michelle, what resonates there with your question for me is, um, is communication and transparency and trying to communicate with, with leadership in a community, if that does exist. And then also with <clears throat> the community at large, um, kind of early and often, um, and I, you know, the, the, our policy, you know, outlines requirements around that. But I think one of the things that we're learning is that engaging again, community leadership and the community at large, even before the process has begun, um, is, you know, um, you know, hedges towards success, um, Yeah, I'll add on to that. I can, I cannot agree more, Chad, especially with the early and often portion. I think it's really tough sometimes to kind of get an idea of what is the administrator really going to be doing in the community and how does that line up with what's already been doing. Like you mentioned, there's already staff um, or community members who are already participating. You know, is the sentiment that they're going to be displaced by the administrator, that they're not going to have any input. So we want to make sure that we're having that early communication so that the administrator and those current participants can work together toward it. And I think that's where that messaging about what is the purpose about the administrator? How long do we anticipate them being here? What is their role? All that's really important to make sure that folks have that understanding of it. I think some things that we've seen in the past have been, um, yeah, that that feeling that you're not going to have any, any say or involvement in your own wa water once there is an administrator. And so that's something that we really want to combat that perception and but understand where it's coming from since i know it was mentioned earlier um it's a kind of a newer process we haven't been doing it you know for decades so that kind of learn as you go portion so we want to figure out like okay is that resistance if there is resistance coming from just a lack of understanding about what that process is in which case how can we have those conversations to put that at ease or is it more yes we do actually understand what it's going to do and there's another reason why we have concerns about it. So I think just having those listening session type conversations to really understand where is this sentiment coming from and making sure that we can work in partnership with those folks to move that process forward um, is all going to be really key to that. Thank you, Michelle. I don't see any more questions in chat um, or any raised hands. I don't know if anybody else has any more questions they'd like to address. Well, I just want to thank our presenters today. You did a great job. It was a great presentation. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, James, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, definitely. Artina, I guess I would just note that, you know, we will share out these slides after this presentation, and we'll also make sure to share links to some of the resources we've discussed, so the drinking water policy or the administrative policy handbook, as well as the FAQ. Um, we'll make sure to provide that information along with our contacts. And uh, we have another upcoming training. It will be the 
CWSRF and DWSRF environmental package. That'll be on May 2nd uh, between 8.30 and 11.30. Um, please attend. We have a lot of great information on the, on the upcoming or for the envir environmental package training as well. Uh, thank you everybody for attending and um, please see the uh, fill out the training evaluation form by clicking clicking on the link within uh, I guess should we put that in the chat? Did you do that already, Ivy? We'll drop the link in the chat for you to fill out the training evaluation form. Thank you everybody for joining us. Great job, everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.